On behalf of myself, Holly Anand, a PhD student in geography and planning and a member of the Global Institute of Water Security and president of the Young Professionals Group for Global Water Futures, and Corin Schuster-Wallace, who is a water and health researcher um, with Global Water Futures, also a member of the Global Institute for Water Security and associate professor in the Department of Geography and Planning. We would like to welcome you to the final lecture of the Women in Water lecture series for the semester. We recognize that we are that the University of Saskatchewan's main campus is situated on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. As such, we pay respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Today, we're pleased to present uh, Dr. Gwen Flowers from Simon Fraser University and Caroline Aubrey Wake, who's a PhD candidate from our U of S Cold Water Lab in Canmore. Um, we'd also like to welcome everyone that's here in the room today and those of us who are or those of you, sorry, who are joining us online. I know we have a group at uh, Wilfrid Laurier and maybe some folks from McMaster as well as U of S folks who uh, couldn't join us in the room. So welcome, welcome everyone. Um, before we move too much further, I'd also like to thank our sponsors of this event, Global Water Futures, Global Water Futures Young Professionals and the Global Institute for Water Security. Uh, without the resources that each of those groups have commit, committed to this effort, um, we would not be in a room together today. As those of you who have tuned in for the previous lectures, you'll know that this series was conceived in response to the recognition that we really need to showcase and we need opportunities to showcase female researchers, particularly in water sciences, and to provide leadership to opportunities for our young female professionals. And it was also conceived to draw attention to the gendered nature of water and to hopefully inspire a few of you at least to include gender-based analyses in your research as appropriate. As Holly mentioned, we're talking about snow and ice and you may think, okay, snow and ice, they have no gender. <laughs> Why are we here in a women and water lecture series beyond having two female researchers to share their stories? But much of the permanent snow and ice around the world is found either in poles or mountains, nothing new there. And that's why, in part, the mountainous regions of the world are called the water towers of the world. And that water is used for energy generation, it's used for domestic use, it's used for agriculture, it's used for economy. But what's really interesting is there's a gender dimension to how those products and resources are accessed. And there's also a gender dimension to how they're controlled. And with climate change, we're changing <laughs> these water towers. We're changing the solid and liquid precipitation. We're warming up our summers and we're reducing the snow in winter. And so we're altering these per, uh, permanent snow and ice resources that we have. And basically, it's been explained to me and I've explained it to others previously that we're using up our savings account. And so when we really need it to be there, those water towers aren't going to be there for us. And so the ramifications of that in the future will definitely have a gender dimension. So it's a pleasure to have both of you here and we look forward to hearing about your research and what else you can tell us about snow and ice. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'll do, uh, I'll do some formal, oh, do introductions, some formal here. introductions here. Yeah, oh, next okay. page, that's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so as you may have noticed, we're gonna try something a little bit different for today's lecture. And the format is gonna be what I'm calling a structured conversation. Uh, so we've invited Gwen and Caroline to have a discussion between the two of them and build some dialogue around um, the topic and to um, sort of work together and uh, highlight each of your research as well as maybe some of the experiences that you've gained as female glaciologists. So I'll introduce you both and then uh, we'll turn it over to you and following their presentation we'll then open up to questions from the audience and have a hopefully what's a nice group discussion. Uh, before I do that for anybody that's following us online or if you want to pull out your phone and tweet about what's happening here today we're using the hashtag women and water. Uh, which I think I used this morning in a couple of tweets. So if you uh, if you want to be part of the conversation that way, go ahead and uh, we'll troll that a little bit for any questions from the audience at the end. 
So first I'll introduce uh, Dr. Gwen Flowers. She's received degrees in physics and geophysics prior to holding postdoc fellowships at UBC and at the University of Iceland. She was appointed the Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Glaciology in 2005 at Simon Fraser University and is currently a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences. The SFU Glaciology Group, led by Dr. Flowers, uses field data and computer models to better understand the roles of glaciers and ice sheets in the global climate system. In 2006, Dr. Flowers launched a field-based research program in the St. Elias Mountains of the Yukon. Her research team has developed computer models that explain how water flows in and under glaciers, how climate is altering the geometry and dynamics of ice caps, and, how, and why glaciers are such effective agents of landscape evolution. Their most recent work has focused on the underlying cause of glacier surging and the dynamics of outburst floods from ice dammed lakes. Some of you may know Caroline. Caroline Aubrey Wake received a Bachelor of Earth System Sciences at McGill in 2014 and continued for, an in for a Master of Science in Earth Sciences, which she finished in 2016. After taking some time off school to ski in the Canadian Rockies, she decided to return to school and started her PhD with Professor John Pomeroy in the fall of 20, sorry, 2017. Uh, she's currently based at the Cold Water Lab in Canmore. So thanks for traveling, both of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Caroline started studying glaciers in a, as an undergraduate student at McGill, where she analyzed data collected on tropical glaciers in the Andes. But it is during a semester abroad in Fairbanks, Alaska, that she first conducted glaciology fieldwork and gained experience with glacier hydrology research. Her current research with the University of Saskatchewan focuses on glaciers closer to home in the Canadian Rockies. Her work focuses on understanding the processes driving streamflow generation in these glacierized headwater catchments and how the process will change under future climates. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to start a little bit discussing a little bit of my research. So uh, to put in context of the discussions that we're going to have a little bit after. So really for my work, um, I focus on mountain glacierized catchments. And I really try to understand two questions, which is where does stream flow come from in these environments? And also, how does it vary? And it's changing really fast because alpine glaciers are melting. So the, my main site is Plato Glacier in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, and it's one of the most studied glaciers in the world. So in fact, it has the second longest time series of measurement, uh, the, the winner being in Sweden, I believe. So it's a really well studied glacier, which is awesome because it's remote, it's hard to access, but we have a lot of data for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and where my role comes in for my project is to really try to understand uh, the variability in the stream flow and the processes that generate that stream flow. Uh, and some of the questions I can try to understand and try to answer is, for example, at Pedo, uh, how has streamflow volume and compositioned composition varied over the last 30 years? So, uh, for example, this graph is something I, I've been working on. So the black line is streamflow volume, uh, annual volume, and the colors are the different components of the streamflow. So, for example, you, you have about 60% uh, of the streamflow that comes from snow. This is the light blue, and then you gradually get towards rainfall. So with things like this, I can start to investigate, is there any trends? Over the last 30 years, there's no trends. The stream flow has not been changing uh, very continuously. Uh, but there's a lot of variability. So once I have done that, I can look at more specific questions. So for example, how does it vary between high flow and low flow years? So there's no, over the last 30 years, there's not necessarily any uh, trends uh, in, in the stream flow. So it's not either increasing or decreasing. But there's a lot of variability. So what's the difference between, for example, low flow years and high flow years? And these are the kind of questions I can really start to understand. And then once I gain the understanding of that system, I can predict into the future and say, how is that variability going to translate in a warmer, drier, or wetter climate? And, and how is that environment going to change? And how is it going to impact the water resources downstream? Because Pedo is at the headwater of some, and then the Canadian Rockies are at the headwater of some of the major river in North America. So mm -hmm. uh, understanding what's going on at the top will really help us understand what's, what's following uh, downstream. Mm. So that's kind of an overview of what I study. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your research topics? Yeah, as, as Holly mentioned, the overall goal of my research program is really to understand the role of glaciers and climate in glaciers and ice sheets in the global climate system. And I do this with my group by studying fundamental processes in the hopes that ultimately these will lead to better projections of change in the cryosphere. And so the way I think about this is what you referenced, that glaciers and ice sheets together are both on the one hand, this incredible resource. They store about three quarters of Earth's fresh water. 
But on the other hand, they present this enormous threat globally in terms of sea level by harboring the equivalent of about 70 meters of potential sea level rise, and also locally, as you studied, um, in the form of hazards due to outburst floods and ice avalanches, things like that. So going back to my overall research goal, I've worked quite a bit in a few different areas, really on the boundaries of these ice masses, so surface processes, looking at ice climate interactions. I've worked a lot on glacier bed processes or subglacial processes, looking at glacier sliding, surging, which is a very dramatic form of unstable glacier flow, water drainage in and under glaciers and ice sheets, and outburst floods. And then finally, a recent theme in my work is really looking at the role of internal dynamics of these systems when we're thinking about their overall responses to climate. So being able ultimately to disentangle the impact of climate on these systems from the changes that result from their own internal dynamics. So I was just going to give you a couple of examples of the types of projects that I've done. My group and I have been working in Yukon, um, looking at these ice climate interactions by directly monitoring the climate forcing meteorological variables and the direct response of glaciers in terms of their mass balance. And this type of work leads ultimately to improve fidelity and transferability of models that we use to estimate mass balance. And like you, we might want to do that for time periods where we have data or we might want to project into the future. This is just showing an example of two different glaciers for two different years, the modeled summer melt using an array of four models ranging from very simple to more complex. Something we've been working on recently has to do with the geologic substrate of glaciers. So I'm really interested in what makes glaciers surge and what makes them unstable. So my student Jeff Crompton and I have been e examining the bedrock characteristics in 20 different glacier basins, half of which have surge type glaciers and half of which have ordinary glaciers. And this inquiry has been really exciting for us. It's led to a new hypothesis to explain why some glaciers surge and why neighboring glaciers don't. And that seems to be strongly correlated with the extent of bedrock fracture, which we think has implications for erosion and therefore shear stress at the bed. And just uh, surging glaciers have been kind of a unknown. Like the, we haven't really been able to understand what controls surging glacier in the last. 20 to 30 year in glaciology, they're one of the unknown and uh, unresolved problem, right? So that, that yeah. is quite a, a good advance, an interesting advance in the field of glaciology. Well, I think in, if I, in my understanding of surging glaciers. Yeah, I agree. I think it's one of those great unsolved mysteries. When a glacier is surging, we know why it surges. We know that there's high water pressure at the bed and it's very slippery. But that, that problem was solved in the 80s. And I think this problem was kind of abandoned for a while because we still can't explain why this glacier does have this behavior and its neighbor doesn't. So that's, it's really the underlying cause, I think, that's still a mystery. And that's part of what this okay. geologic substrate work addresses. We also spend a lot of time doing geophysics on glaciers to really understand properties of the within the ice and properties underneath the ice. And all this data collection really leads to an improved theoretical understanding of some things we think are important. So for example, this is a model of glacier enthalpy. That just means temperature and water content. And when we drive this model with increasing atmospheric temperatures or decreasing glacier mass balance, like a thinning fern pack, we find we can make glaciers transition from almost entirely cold to almost entirely temperate. And these two effects would be competing in a warming climate. So we found counterintuitively that in our field area, we expect a warming climate to actually produce colder glaciers. So we've been able to come up with some really interesting theoretical insights from these data. And then just you know, on the side, we like to take advantage of the experiments that nature conducts for us. This is one example we've been working on a lot. This is an ice dammed lake um, in Yukon territory of Canada. And we've been looking at how this lake fills and drains and monitoring with all with monitoring it with all sorts of instruments. And we found that these types of lakes, we look at the water there, it looks like a lot of water, but we've actually found in doing a water balance that most of the water in this catchment is actually under the ice or in the ice. And that's something that we didn't know before. And then finally, it's just thematically with my work, we also do a lot of numerical modeling. Um, and models that we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit are just a way um, a way to complete our observations, a way to see into the future, a way to test hypotheses. And this is an example of modeling the demise of Barnes ice cap on Baffin Island um, within about the next 300 years. And that's a very, um, this is a symbolic glacier retreat because this is the last vestige of the Laurentide ice sheet in North America. So in 300 years, we think the ice age will truly be over. Um, so it seems like a lot of your work focuses on what's going on 
in the glacier. So my mm. work mostly focuses on what's going on at the surface and how the water melts on the surface. Can you maybe uh, chat a little bit more about why what's going on inside the glacier? So ice dynamics are, are an important mm. component of, of glaciology. Yeah, I think they're so interesting, but um, let's just think about the very large scale right now. Here are pictures of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets are two modern continental scale ice sheets. The colors you see are satellite altimetry data showing um, surface rising in blue colors and surface lowering in red colors. And so we can see some obvious patterns in these data. But one of the things that really catches your eye is this big yellow and blue blob. Maybe I'll point it out here in Antarctica, here in West Antarctica. That change in elevation is due entirely to the turning off and on of what are called ice streams, these fast flowing corridors of ice within the ice sheet. And these ice streams are entirely controlled by what's happening at the bed. And they're, um, to a large extent, isolated from climate. So to me, these internal dynamics are really important to um, quantify and to understand because we want to be able to correctly attribute the changes that we're detecting in these systems. So that's an example for the ice sheets, but there are also examples at the glacier scale. And here I'm just going to show you some more videos. This is a phone video I made of a surging glacier that we came across last summer. On the left, you see us approaching the glacier terminus, and you can just see this, this jumble of ice. This glacier advanced about a kilometer in a period of a couple of months. Which is really fast in comparison. <laughs> Most glaciers move a few meters per year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so the glaciologist, for the glaciologist, this is stunning, right? Yeah. These rates are stunning. So these sorts of dramatic um, changes are happening in some of the glaciers we're looking at in Yukon, and they also have implications for the way that we assess the changes we observe. So if we look at, for example, the surface elevation changes mapped in this corner of southwest Yukon over the last decade, we see a lot of red, which means thinning. That's kind of what we expect, right, with this global glacier story. Glaciers are thinning and retreating. But you can also see a lot of blue blobs in this picture. And the glacier we just looked at happens to be this one. So if you zoom in, you see that over the last 10 years, the average elevation change was entirely dominated by this one surge event where you had a huge amount of ice upstream being rapidly transferred downstream. And so it's really important to know about these sorts of effects when we're trying to interpret data like these. So surging is something that um, I find really interesting and exciting. And I'm, I'm also interested to hear what aspects of your work you find the most motivating or exciting. Well, I have to say, so surging glacier are fascinating. <laughs> I always thought they were way too complex. <laughs> and I wanted to focus on something that I could kind of see a little bit better. So I always uh, found that the most motivating part of my work is really to consider glaciers for water. So mm -hmm. uh, this is a picture of Kilkawanka, one of the valley I've worked in uh, in Peru. So the glacier I study is actually at the headwater. We can't really see it. It's just around the corner. But it was kind of a fantastic experience because I show up there as a master's student. I'm really excited to learn about ice. And then I walk past the village, past the stream, with some cows grazing, with some little huts on the side, and I keep walking, and the river that I'm walking along starts at the glacier. So you have this mm. direct consequence of, if I don't understand how this glacier is melting, if I don't know what's going on and I can't help uh, the understanding of the system, the people downstream won't be able to prepare for the change. Mm. So that really helps me like um, on morni Monday morning when you don't really want to <laughs> go to work. And I remember, no, what I do is important, so yeah. mountain, uh, Mountain glaciers as a water resource has always been kind of the, mm -hmm. the motivating um, thought in the background. In terms of what I find the most interesting, uh, what fascinates me is the processes across the scales. So uh, glaciers, sometimes the scale is hard to capture because a glacier can be really big or really wide. And as you zoom in, and there's more and more complexity that appears. So for example, these are pictures of glaciers in the Canadian Rockies and in Peru. And you can see when you're really close by, the heterogeneity is immense. There's a boulder here, there's a crevasse here, there's blue ice here. And trying to understand how these different, uh, th how this heterogeneous environment impacts the melt and impacts the water resources downstream is challenging. But then you walk back a kilometer and you look at it, and all of a sudden it's different kind of uh, spatial heterogeneity where it's a cliff, a talus mm -hmm. slope, a, a proglacial lake, uh, a whole avalanche slope and trying to understand how these different elements interact between each other and influence the melt and which one are important and which one are not is kind of really something that every mm -hmm. time I go into the mountains, I'm fascinated by and I try to understand. And in terms of what I find the most uh, exciting is by far field work. Mm -hmm. So uh, by studying these kind of environment and spending most of my time behind a computer, I do <laughs> get to go uh, in some really beautiful places. And 
the excitement from looking at a place on a map, you know, you have a DEM, you have satellite imagery, you're trying to figure out where you're going to put your weather station, and then getting in there, either hiking in for a day or flying in, and actually being on the site that you've been planning to study for a year, two years, mm -hmm. uh, and discovering hands-on what it is, is definitely uh, kind of the most exciting part that I'm always uh, very stressed about, mm -hmm. but always very much <laughs> looking forward to. That sounds very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that we've kind of covered what mm. is really exciting about the science, mm. a little bit more of a dire subject, mm. uh, what do you think are the key like um, challenges that are gonna there we go. come up in the in the discipline that are that the discipline of snow and ice research mm. is really facing? Yeah, thinking about challenges, I really tried to step back and think again about these two roles for glaciers and ice sheets. So there being a resource and there being a threat, and. I'm speaking from the perspective of the glaciological community with which I'm most familiar. And I think one of our key challenges is that we're tasked with making continental scale projections on very short time scales. So we want to know what's happening with these continental scale ice sheets on human time scales, so time scales of decades we can plan for. And when we think of ice sheets, they respond on all sorts of time scales, but up to millennial time scales, right? So they can be very slow to respond to some changes. We're basically being asked to predict glacier and ice sheet weather. And we all know it's easier to predict climate than weather. So we could say maybe what's going to happen in 3,000 years or 10,000 years much more easily than we could say what's happening with these ice sheets by the year 2080. So that's a huge challenge, this, um, the spatial and temporal scales on which we have to work. Another challenge, though, is making spatially localized projections. And this has to do with the resource that you were talking about. This is an example of a study that shows basins that will be more and, less, more and less affected by glacier change in terms of their runoff characteristics around the world. So purple basins are the ones st that stand to be most affected by the year 2100. And we know that over a billion people depend on water sourced from glacier-fed rivers around the world. So we not only want to be able to make these regional projections, but we want to be able to say for a catchment, What's the hydrograph going to look like when we go from having this much ice to somewhat less ice to no ice? So what's that going to look like for people planning for water resources? And this is just a um, spectacular example of resourcefulness that I've come across, these con this construction of these ice stupas in India, where because there's water available but running off is groundwater and it's cold enough, that water can be diverted to freeze onto structures that then form these sort of beautiful formations that yield water when it's most needed in the warmest and driest seasons. So we'd like to be able to make predictions that are locally relevant, and we'd like to be able to say what the impacts of those changes are going to be on downstream ecosystems, for example, and that's something, of course, really important. Um, in BC, everything comes down to salmon eventually. So making those um, spatially localized projections, I think, is a big challenge. Another challenge that our community is facing, I think, is this um, the complementarity and the investment in both technology and science. So my observation has been that technology is rapidly developing, and we're developing these capabilities to make observations at a pace that we can scarcely interpret. So there's been a lot of effort put into satellite remote sensing, which is really the only way to monitor um, at the spatial scales that are required. But at the same time, I think that's taken some of our human capital away from generating ideas and really being able to interpret what's going on. So I think in our community, we really need to think carefully about um, are we investing enough of our human and financial capital in being able to understand these changes and in generating new ideas when we can do things like this, where we're monitoring the continental scale Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet mass loss on monthly timescales now with the GRACE satellites. So our technological powers are so great, but I just fear that they're outstripping our ability to make um, proper use of them. And I, I think that can translate quite well to all the geosciences where mm -hmm. a new technology and new data analysis technique can really take on a, a huge focus, but we uh, mm. at some point have to remember that we're trying to understand what's going on, not just collect everything, but you need to have a balance between the two. Yeah. Um, I s on, on more the glacier hydrology, so more the glacier as a resource uh, challenge, I think that um, one of the big challenges that we're facing is uh, at the intersection between the sub-disciplines. So uh, the glaciologists really like their glaciers, but kind of ignore the fact that there might be vegetation downstream or there might be so a lake or something like that. There might yeah. be other hydrological things going on. Uh, the groundwater hydrologists kind of typically ignore what's going on above the surface. Snow is not important for them. It's really once it's <laughs> below the surface. 
uh, and well, snow hydrologists som or modelers sometimes will not pret pretend there's no glacier and just say it's <laughs> snow. Um, so really, I think in every single field, we're doing some really good advances, but I think that we're lagging behind at the intersection of the bubble, and I think that the next big step in the, in the science is going to be to see mountains as an integrated system, not just as some groundwater, some glacier, mm -hmm. and some plants lower down. And I, I really think that that's where it's going to go in the next, maybe the next generation of science is where it's going to mm -hmm. be. Uh, but it's going to take quite a lot of thinking in terms of both having the people that are highly trained in one discipline yeah. and the people that can see it as a system and getting them to sit together and do their science together. Mm -hmm. So I think that m merging our knowledge system will be really, really important. Yeah, that's an important challenge. Yeah. Uh, another challenge that I can see facing is the fact that um, lots of people don't necessarily realize uh, that glaciers are so important because glaciers are so remote. So for example, here, Saskatoon River mm. does start, the Saskatchewan River. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. But it can work too long. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, does start in the mountains, but you don't really think about it because like, you don't even see the mountains from mm. here. Um, so I think for a lot of people, mountains are so remote and so far away that they don't really realize that they're really important. Uh, but for some other people, uh, mountains can be incredibly important. If some people live right in the mountains and right downstream of, of those glaciers. And uh, these mountains have so a day-to-day -day impact on them. And one of those big ex big things I've seen is when I was doing some work in Peru, in the Cordillera Blanca, there's a lot of proglacial lakes that form at the toe of the glaciers. And then you can have um, ice avalanches or rock avalanches that fall into the lake. It creates a, a mini tsunami, a, a big wave that will then breach the, the dam in front of the lake and then cause a massive flood downstream and, and kind of wipe out villages. Uh, and in, in the Cordillera Blanca, they've done a lot of work on that with the government to monitor the lakes and drain the lakes gradually to avoid this kind of risk. Uh, but there's always, it's, it's becoming more and more a problem with climate change and further glacier melt. And actually, if, if anyone is interested in hearing more about you know, the mountain hazards in this environment, there's a great book written by Mark Carey, who's an historian, who really documented the impact of, of climate change and glaciers on, on local population. And so I think it's really useful for physical scientists to kind of go and hear yeah. a little bit more about the impacts of, of their science and the system that they study. Uh, but you've studied in Iceland and mm -hmm. in other parts of the world. So I was wondering if you had maybe more example of this type of uh, local impact of glaciers on communities. Yeah, Iceland's such an interesting example. I did a postdoc there, as Holly mentioned, and it's a place where glaciers feature in people's daily lives. You know, they're very visible. Um, there's a tight connection between the, the culture and language and the ice masses. And of course, it's a well-resourced country that's sparsely populated. So they've done things like invest in building, building these engineering structures to um, dissipate the effects of outburst floods. So what you're seeing in this picture are these structures that are intended to keep this river relatively channelized. This is coming out of the Vatniokol ice cap, and it's the proglacial area that experiences the most outburst floods in Iceland. So they've really taken a proactive response to dealing with these hazards, but they're able to because um, of the, the resources. I also think in Iceland, this, this cultural connection is really tight. I mean, this, this is just an example of a wonderful book written by their Nobel Prize winning author, Halder Lexness, called Under the Glacier. And so they have all sorts of um, mythology tied in with the presence of glaciers. And the word glacier in Icelandic is actually on the official birth registry. So I met people named Glacier when I lived there. So that sort of speaks to the connection. Um, but Carolyn, as you were mentioning, sometimes glaciers are out of view and they're more difficult for people to conceptualize um, in their daily lives, despite the fact that they pose an even bigger hazard than they might in Iceland. And something that I found inspiring, um, although I haven't been there, is the work that's going on in places like Bhutan, where these proglacial and ice marginal lakes uh, present huge threats to downstream communities. And these communities have come together, and in this example, are excavating by hand a deeper spillway to drain this lake that poses a threat to the community. So they're starting to put a lot of effort into being able to mitigate the hazards posed by these lakes. And I, we often think of glacier lake outburst floods as the glaciological hazard, but something that's been so interesting in the last couple of years in my community is the identification of brand new hazards, brand new types we didn't even know exist. This is uh, two images before on the left, after on the right, of one of the two collapses of these two Tibetan glaciers. And these were, these were phenomena that were so new, we didn't even have a word for them. So they were described as 
massive collapses due to a surge-like instability. But they were really these low-angle, high-velocity ice avalanches where these glaciers really just detached themselves from their headwalls and from their beds and rushed downstream, in this case, killing nine people and hundreds of animals. So this is a type of hazard that we're now seeing almost for the first time with climate change that didn't even have a name. So I think these glaciological hazards are presenting some surprises to us that, um, that we're going to confront more and more in the future. And these things aren't just taking place um, far from home. There's an example that many of you probably know about in southwest Yukon again. There's a major hydrological reorganization as the Kaskawalsh Glacier retreated, which normally drains north. Its water drains north along the Slims River all the way to the Bering Sea. And over the period of um, a very short time in 2016, the glacier retreated to the point that all of its runoff now drains to the south, to the Gulf of Alaska. So this is a major shift. It's resulted in a drop of the lake level of Kluwani Lake by a couple of meters that has, has had implications for fish spawning grounds around communities such as Burwash Landing. It's also had an immediate impact on air quality, and presumably um, it'll have an impact on human health because this abandoned floodplain now hardly has any water in it, and so all this dust is available to be mobilized. I was just there uh, um, last week, and you can see often dust blowing down out of this floodplain and down the lake, and it's really um, changing the air quality in these communities. That is, yeah, that's a very dramatic yeah. landscape change. That's way faster yeah. than when you typically picture of glacier melting. It's they're melting slowly but surely, and at some point they'll disappear. But it turns yeah. out that a lot of it is glaciers are not that static after all, and they can yeah. be quite unstable and, and react quite fast to certain events. I think that's one of the things so remarkable about this period in which we're living. We're seeing changes that should take place on geologic time scales, these very long time scales. We're seeing them with our own eyes, not even in our lifetimes, but just in a couple of years. I think that's really stunning. Yeah, it was a little terrifying, but yes, very, very, very motivating to keep <laughs> working on these problems. Um, switching gear a little bit, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit mm -hmm. about the, the secret <laughs> life of a glaciologist. Um, the <laughs> The what is the day-to-day -day life, mm. or uh, more specifically, kind of the modeling versus field work. So what we've talked about so far, mm. uh, there's quite a lot of field work involved, but there's also some fairly complex modeling work. And I was wondering if, did you start with a balance? Or did you start mm. as a physicist that did applied uh, physics to gla glaciers? Or did you start more as a someone that went in the field and took observations? And how did that kind of evolve through your career? Mm, yeah, it's always inter interesting to hear different people's stories. So we both enjoy field work a lot. Um, I started in physics, but I credit my dad with having taken us out a lot as kids, uh, lots of camping, hiking, skiing, and rafting. And so he instilled in me a love for the mountains. So I always enjoyed that. But I always liked physics and math in school. And so it wasn't until graduate school when I finally found geophysics, which is those two things brought together. And when I was thinking about graduate school, much like the students who contact me now, I was imagining this, right? This is field work. This is the life of a field glaciologist. It's kind of what it looks like every day. So that's what I had in mind. No, it's not. <laughs> 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 when I started my PhD, and this is what my PhD ended up looking like. I, I didn't even know what numerical modeling was when I started, but that's what I did for my PhD, and I learned to love it, and I really had an appreciation for doing both um, observational science and theoretical and numerical work. But during my PhD, I also had the opportunity to spend a month every summer on the, um, in the stunning steel valley of the St. Elias Mountains in the shadow of these giant peaks, working on Trapridge Glacier with my supervisor, Gary Clark, from the University of British Columbia. And it was um, this also that I truly grew to love. And I'm sure, like you, one of the great things about fieldwork is just this combination of the physical and the intellectual together. So I really, um, I really do love that. And this was uh, such an important experience for me that when I had the opportunity to start my own research program, when I got my job at SFU, I went back to the St. Elias Mountains and I started my own field program there. And this place is just um, one of these marvelous places to work. Our area is in the traditional territory of the Kluwani, White River, and champaign Ajac First Nations, so it's an area that has a rich cultural history. It's an area that in the St. Elias Mountains alone, there's an ice field that's the size of Belgium. So any glaciologist's dream, just in terms of the sheer volume of ice. 
but it's also an area that has these extreme environmental gradients imposed by the topography. So you go from sea level in the Gulf of Alaska to some of the highest peaks in North America, including Mount Logan, in less than 100 kilometers. So it's just an outstanding place to study questions related to glaciers, climate, tectonics, landscape evolution. And just to give you a sense of the scale in this photo, there's an airplane in the middle of that picture there. And Logan is the tallest mountain in Canada. It is, right? yeah. That's so this is our highest peak here. Not only does, does this area have all this ice, but it has very exciting glaciers. So it has these surge-type glaciers that experience these flow instabilities, and it's a real um, geophysical playground for anyone interested in these processes. And as I mentioned, there's a close connection between people and glaciers. Um, glaciers are thought to be sentient there and to respond to human capriciousness. And in fact, in the oral traditions from this area, glacier surges were caused as a response to transgressions that people have had committed in and around them. This is an excellent book for anyone interested in that interaction between um, nature and culture and the history of exploration in that area and the First Nations relationship with glaciers. It's a book by Julie Cruikshank. And in Peru as well, there's quite a bit of a uh, people that thought that when they engineered the lake, al the, the mm. engineered the dams in front of the al the lakes, the proglacial lakes, to prevent uh, outburst floods, so to drain them. Uh, at that point, it caused a drought or some kind of anoma anomaly in the climate, mm. and it was dry for a few years. So the locals got thought that the engineering had angered the gods of the mountains. Mm. Uh, I might like. I'm sure there were some more specific terms in there, but <laughs> they went out and destroyed the, the, the monitoring program mm -hmm. and the dams that had been built because they thought that that was the reason. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's quite a, uh, there too, a, a link between spirituality and, and glaciers. Yeah. yeah, I find that a really interesting aspect of working in this area and, um, and really rewarding. And for us, it's a privilege to be able to work on this traditional territory that's far away from our homes. So I'm, I'm very lucky to get to go to these places regularly when we go up there and Spring, our trips look something like this. They're, they're ski-based trips, but there's, there's not really any skiing. We're on skis, but working. And then in summer, it looks a little bit different. Um, when we go for longer periods, we have a more established camp. And when we're up there, we'd be doing things like deploying and maintaining instruments like GPS towers. Um, we'd be doing geophysical surveys of all types. And then we'd be doing whatever else, uh, stream gauging or looking at snow pit um, characteristics, depending on individual projects. So I think. We both appreciate um, being in the field and the value that data provides. Um, but we thought a bit about data and models together. And, and my thinking there is that data are useful for all sorts of obvious reasons, tuning and testing all sorts of models, conceptual models and ideas, up to um, theoretical models and numerical models. But I think we forget that they themselves are just a great source of ideas and inspiration. In my group, we've written papers that have no data in them whatsoever, but that were directly inspired by data we collected that caused us to rethink whole concepts and come up with theoretical models before moving on to actually um, explain our data. But on the other hand, I really appreciate models because they allow us to strip away a lot of the complexity that can get in the way of interpreting our observations. Um, like your work, we can test hypotheses, we can make predictions. And then nature has a lot of variables that change all at once, and they're a bit hard to control. So with modeling, we can control our variables and thereby do experiments that nature doesn't always permit. So those are the, some of the things that I appreciate about data and models. I'm wondering if that's the but same in your area. I think that area. actually sums incredibly well how data and model are codependent. Yeah. And a lot of people have a tendency to yeah. get stuck in uh, modeling or field science, mm -hmm. but I think that really uh, when we join the forces of both, mm -hmm. uh, we can really come into some really interesting scientific insights. That's definitely yeah. where I like to be because I yeah. like to be in the field, but I also like to try to understand what's going on with the data after. I think um, we're really lucky to be able to do both, yeah. right? Because I think there's some disciplines that are, that are so well developed that there's no way one person can do both. But I also really appreciate that doing both um, prevents you from having some sort of unhealthy reverence for either or prevents you from being um, you know, overly skeptical or overly optimistic about what data or models have to offer. When you collected your own data, it's hard to say, the <laughs> data's wrong, my model is right. <laughs> or sometimes you know exactly that's true. So yeah. uh, that's yeah. definitely a, a, good, a good impact of doing both. Yes. Um, so kind of third topic here that we're going to switch gear a little bit more. Um, so glaciology and snow and ice research is, has traditionally been a, a male-dominated field uh, where 
in my experience, I've often been the only woman on field trips. I've often been the only presenter at a conference. Mm -hmm. I've only often been the only woman in a research group. Um, and for me, something that has really helped has been to have uh, role models and mentors in the, f in the field, uh, especially so as soon as I started. Um, so I was lucky enough, this is uh, the first two women I did science with. So I was an undergraduate student. I liked skiing, so I decided to go do an undergrad semester in Fairbanks in Alaska. And I showed up there and I said, I would like to do research. <laughs> Can anyone help me? And uh, luckily, I was able to work with Regina Hawk and Erin Pettit, which were two uh, very accomplished scientists in, in glaciology. So as soon as I started my research, uh, my, my career path down the academic mm -hmm. world, uh, I was able to see myself and, and see that, hey, they are women professor glaciologists, are awesome researchers and, and humans. Um, so I was really lucky to kind of have that that view and that possibility to uh, picture myself as a, as a glaciologist. So I knew that it would, could be possible. And I was wondering if it's something that um, was part of your career path as well, that you had role models or mentors that were there to kind of help you along, along the way, or, yeah. or how, how the maybe that changed in the last generation yeah. of, of scientists? I think this shows a generational change between us that really is encouraging to me. These are my mentors. Um, these are two wonderful people who played really key roles in my life. But I would say that um, I was really lacking a role model that I could look at as someone that I could aspire to be. So, um, but I don't want to dismiss their contributions. Carl Wyman from the University of Colorado on the left um, was one of my physics instructors in undergrad. And he sought me out. I didn't even, I didn't know him personally, but he sought me out and said, do you want to do an undergraduate thesis in my lab? And I said, I'm, I'm kind of busy with courses, and also I'm working part-time, refing volleyball for intramurals. And he said, stop refing volleyball. I'll pay you to cool and trap rubidium atoms in my lab. And I said, OK. Um, and h this lab that we were working in, um, a couple years later, won the Nobel Prize for the work that they were doing. And so I feel like Carl found me, picked me out of my part-time minimum wage refereeing job and said, I think you should instead work on this Nobel Prize winning project. And so I'm so grateful for um, the way in which he and Gary elevated me to do things I wouldn't have even thought to do myself. Gary Clark was my PhD advisor at the University of British Columbia, sort of intellectual giant in our field and one of the most generous people that you would ever meet. And Gary, again, believed in me he took a chance on me and uh, trained me to be a field scientist and a modeler. I wasn't good at field work when I started. My hands were cold. I think I was probably kind of whiny. I wasn't very robust. Um, but Gary gave me this opportunity to develop into uh, the scientist that I am today. As a side note, so these two people are fantastic mentors. Gary also was the one who taught me how to write. I credit him also with teaching me how to cook. I didn't really learn to cook until I was <laughs> in the field <laughs> in grad school. So he's taught me all sorts of um, life skills as, as well as being um, the most influential person in my scientific career. So I'm extremely grateful to these people who I think really believed in me more than I believed in myself at the time. But when I was a grad student, um, there were no female faculty around. And I was quite aware that I can't grow up to be a Gary Clark. And I never even. I never even aspired to it. It never even really crossed my mind to maybe pursue a research career like I have today until well into my postdoc. And so I think that's something that's changing with the generations. And I'm so delighted to hear that you happened across these two fantastic colleagues of mine, Regina and Erin, very early in your career. Um, that gives me hope that the opportunities that are available to us are much more apparent. Um, but I credit the people that were in my life as mentors with really probably being ahead of their time in many ways, even down to the point of, of giving me gender-specific advice. I remember Gary saying at one point as when I was a grad student, he said, you know, people generally say you shouldn't put too many equations in your talks because, you know, people don't like looking at equations. But he said, if I were you, a young, early career woman in geophysics, I would put all the equations in my talk. And so he was suggesting to me certain strategies that I should use because of who I was and where I was at the time that would be different than the kind of advice you would give um, to the whole group. So um, these sorts of people were fantastic mentors, but we need mentors and role models. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good to hear that things are evolving and starting changing and yeah. that it's, it's possible to have positive experience. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, 
difficult situation that ari that can arise in, in mm -hmm. field work, especially as a woman in the field. But uh, there's hope, and it seems yeah. like not it doesn't always go terrible. So there, so you can do field work and still have a great time and be supported yeah. by incredible mentors and incredible team, an incredible team. So that's yeah. that's really actually really good to hear. Yeah. Uh, but still, what uh, advice would you maybe give to some woman that can could be put off by uh, field-based research that don't yeah. like the idea of going in the field for long periods at a time without showering maybe, maybe yeah. there is a shower, <laughs> uh, field life. Um yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so if this is your idea of the perfect day in July, then you know field works for you no matter what. But this isn't most people's idea of a great summer day. Um, but that's okay, because the one thing that I've learned from starting out is, I was an avid hiker, but I was no means by no means a mountaineer or anyone particularly rugged, field skills and resilience can be developed with practice. You don't start out becoming a field scientist by having all those things. So I think now in my mid-40s compared to my mid-20s, I'm tougher, my hands don't get as cold because I know how to keep them warm. You know, I know how to sort of deal with all these things in the field that took years of experience, but you can develop into a competent field researcher. So if you don't have all those things now, I would say don't worry about it. If you're at all interested, I would seek out opportunities to do field work and to get involved. But if you do and you don't like it, then let's just say it, it is okay not to like field work. Field science isn't everything. Many of my colleagues do all of their work indoors and are making incredibly important contributions to our theoretical understanding of the cryosphere, to our ability to detect changes in the cryosphere with remote sensing. Field science is important, but it's not everything. And it's not for everybody, and that's fine. But I think if it interests you at all, you, you shouldn't be put off. And then another, the next question that comes is, well, do I have to look like this to do field work? Because this is what a field researcher looks like to me. And here I'm picking on our, our fine colleagues, Matthew Sturm and John Holmgren. Um, but it is pretty there typical. Are, there are a lot of beards, yeah. right? <laughs> but you don't have to have one to do field work. So I, like Caroline, I was the only female in any field team I'd ever been on as a grad student and a postdoc until I started my own program when I really made an effort to have some kind of um, diverse field crew. And though not through deliberate effort, I feel like there was a milestone that happened in my research program in 2016 when we had our first all-female field expedition. And it just so happened that the four of us who were going out were all women that year. And I've had many wonderful field trips but this was um, one of the most enjoyable ones and to me represented, um, even though partially accidentally, just a, a marker in my career that, wow, we finally had an all-female field campaign and that was really rewarding. It, it wasn't planned for, it wasn't a, it was just no, happened. No, yeah, it just happened. So Alex on the right was my grad student and then I happened to have a visiting scholar who popped in from France for six months, Colleen, second from the left, and then I needed um, a mountaineer and another colleague to go with us, and that just happened to be Ali Crisciatello, who's on the very left, so it just came together in that way. But the fact that that could happen organically, I think, says something. So that's, um, that to me is very encouraging. And of course, having an all-female field crew solves you know, some of the key problems, like how do you pee on a rope, right? These are the things that people just don't ask, but there's some, there's some you know, remaining injustices in the world. And one of those is sometimes you just can't get off the rope. Yeah, so when you're... It's challenging. A little bit of background on it is that when you're on a glacier, there's hidden crevasses under the snow, so you have to be tied up on a rope altogether to be safe. Uh, glaciers are really flat most of the time, <laughs> so if you need, for example, to go pee, uh, it's, it's, it can be really uh, stressful because you have to just be like, hey, everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that is, in my experience, everyone I talk to, that, that is one of the main challenges of field work, and that is one of the things that most uh, women I go in the field with struggle with mm. and I grew up hiking and skiing and so I, like I was used to it but I figured that if I find this stressful and I find it difficult people that is their first time in the field probably uh, have way more trouble with it so I think there's mm. a lot of kind of small things like that, small that things, yeah. you wouldn't really think about it but it turns out that it can be an important component so I think that having kind of discussion within the lab groups to make sure that everyone is aware of those tiny little things can actually be really, really, really helpful because yeah. Having to pee on a rope should not be a, <laughs> an issue, should not be the reason you don't want to go do field work. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. And that is a question that everyone kind of needs to be fine with. Yeah. So. I have yeah. just trained myself to have a very large bladder, as in this picture here. This was last week on the Tweedsmere Glacier in northern BC. I just hold it all day. 
but it's not comfortable. It's so yeah, I cannot yeah. do that. They're just some they're just some <laughs> things that you know take an extra bit of getting used to. But I would also say, um, if you know you're a new student going into the field or something, come up and ask people who have been there before. What do you do about these? fill in the blanks, all these things, because there's a lot of things you have to figure out for yourself, and it would just be nice to ask people and get some ideas in advance, because we've spent a lot of time in the field, and we've worked out some systems that would be good for other people, too. So I had, yeah, I had that exact experience where the, my first uh, glaciology field trip when I was in Alaska, uh, the Erin put all the women aside, and she had to talk with us about all the small details from which mm. underwear you should wear mm. to uh, peeing to hydration and, and things like that. And it was just great to have a, a professor being, these are the <laughs> things, <laughs> take them, leave yeah. them, but yeah. here are some things that you won't want to think about. And it was really helpful yeah. to kind of start the discussion. Um, I think that's, that's what can be a very good, important uh, thing to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of advices, would you have any advice for maybe established researcher to maybe help everyone in the field? Yes, I, I was really reflected on um, this series being women and water. I kind of reflected on my own experience and thought about, often asked to give, what advice would you give to younger people? And I'm feeling more and more, especially for me with the very positive experiences I've had with other people believing in me and elevating me and making the career that I now have possible, I think the advice that I would give would be mostly to more established researchers. So I would say, here's me being given a chance as a, as a grad student in the field, that we are responsible for establishing the culture in our research groups and camps. I've certainly heard horror stories from some of my colleagues about being in research camps where they weren't in control of the culture. And so, to me, that is my responsibility in to establish a healthy and inclusive culture in my group and in my camps. The other thing I would say from directly from my own experience is give people the chance to develop into the scientists and researchers they have the potential to become. If Gary hadn't given me that chance, um, I wouldn't be where I am today. And so I think we need to recognize that people aren't coming to us with all of these skills, with the full beard and the ruggedness and all this already, right? We are here to train people and to help them cultivate their own field skills and abilities. And then something I have to remind myself of is to be aware of unconscious bias. And I've, I'm saying this because I know that I have these biases and I've even been in situations where I'm hiring a field assistant and in retrospect I can tell that actually I thought I was just hiring that person but I had this whole idea of what this person would be like. And um, I realized I was making assumptions about people that weren't appropriate at the individual level. And so I think we all should um, do what we can to read and be trained to recognize unconscious bias and to think about those things because those generalizations that may apply to a large group um, don't usually apply to individuals and it's certainly unfair to try and apply those things to individuals. And I, I have specific personal examples that remind me how important that is. And then if I were to think of things for the, the emerging or aspiring researchers, you know, I would say um, be proactive in seeking out mentors and role models. I can't imagine anyone at my stage who wouldn't be delighted to hear from a junior colleague who said, could I use you as a sounding board? Or could we go for coffee once a month um, just to chat about professional issues? I would be delighted, and I'm sure most other people would too. I would also encourage you to really cultivate your peer support group. As an example, these are a bunch of students from the McCarthy Summer School on Kennecott Glacier in Alaska in 2016. And when I was a student, I found it uh, really great to attend the Northwest Glaciologist meeting every year where I met a whole cohort of students at my stage of career that um, I grew up with. And so these are the people who become your future colleagues. These are the people who can support you through your career, the people with whom it's probably easy to connect with and easy to collaborate with. So I would both seek out those mentors and role models, but also really cultivate your connections with your own peer group shameless advertisement, a great way <laughs> to connect with your peers is to get involved in, for example, the Young Professional uh, program <laughs> of Global Water Future <laughs> or other organization like mm. that. For There's some for permafrost, there's some for uh, polar research, but I strongly encourage all the early career researcher uh, here and listening online uh, to look at these options and, and get involved in those because those are really some skills and some, uh, mm. some people that you meet and you you learn new things, and it's quite interesting and very gratifying, I mm. would say. Um, Great. 
I think that wraps up the yeah. the structured conversation. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Gwen, <laughs> thank for you. coming it's in and, and chatting <laughs> with us. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you both ever so much for engaging in a structured conversation. Yes. It was really <laughs> enjoyable. I don't know about you, but, well, and more than that, sharing your science, but also your experiences. Mm. That's really important and very valuable, and we appreciate it. Mm. Thank you very much. All of you have sat patiently. <laughs> Caroline got to ask all of the questions. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask either of our presenters? Today, about science or anything. science yeah. experiences, apparently even peeing on a rope. There yeah. you go. Lots it does have to be done. It Lots of trips, done. absolutely. Questions, comments? I see a few people. I, I have a, can I ask a question? Absolutely, okay. why not? Well, <laughs> I'd like to ask a question of Caroline. I mean, through this I've gotten a sense of that things are changing, but I'm wondering what the what the attitude is amongst your cohort and your generation. Do you feel optimistic about this, um, the increase in the number of role models and mentoring and the opportunities for women? What's the, what's the vibe in your community? Um, I th I'm optimistic, I can see change. I don't think it's changing quite fast enough. Mm -hmm. And I also really think it depends on where you are. So you can be in a lab group. So personally, I've always been in lab groups that were inclusive, respectful, mm -hmm. Uh, I've, I haven't had any negative experience. It's been fantastic, but you know, as soon as I read the news, go on Twitter, or talk to most other researchers, uh, female researcher, I hear horror stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in my perspective, things have been going well, but I know that it's not the case anywhere. And I think that a lot of it, um, it, it could be improved and it could change. And a lot of it kind of goes to like calling out the people around you that have behaviors that are not necessarily as nice mm -hmm. or um, an education, like being aware of what's going on, being aware of unconscious bias. And mm -hmm. it, once it starts, I think it's going to change really fast. And it's already much nicer, I think a much nicer discipline than it was mm -hmm. uh, like 10 years ago. So th it's definitely getting uh, better, mm -hmm. but it, it takes a little bit of time, I think. Yeah. I agree. We mm -hmm. are going in the right direction and just look at the mix of people yeah. in the room and online. And speaking of, I don't know, have we had any questions online at all? We'll check that just in case we don't want to leave you out. <laughs> and if not, it's oh, okay. it's really nice. <laughs> likes are good. <laughs> we like <laughs> likes. <laughs> I'm going to give one last call for questions while, and, uh, while we're doing it because the other piece that I appreciated in your presentations was the connection to community and the connection to culture because that, as I said in my opening remarks, really is one of the important elements. Water is not in and of itself and when we're studying water, whatever dimensions of water we're studying, it affects people's lives and livelihoods and cultures and well-being and so being able to recognize and make those links, particularly from snow and ice. I really appreciate that, yeah. particularly from a, a water health perspective. Absolutely. Nobody else? I th yes, we have one question. Um, so I'm working on groundwater right now. I'm wondering if there's anybody looking at the connection between glaciers and groundwater or glaciers and karst. Oh. Oh, um, repeat it. Sure can just answer or mm -hmm. I repeat? Well, it's the connection between glaciers and groundwater yeah. or glaciers and karst. Um, so I was just learning about this actually two days ago. I was talking with someone uh, and they were just telling me that there's this, oh, I was talking with John. John knows everyone in that did <laughs> research in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, and there's someone, I can't quite remember the name, but I could probably look it up, that studied uh, karst, karst. So in the Rockies, it's limestone, so there's all these massive caves underneath the glacier that actually can store a lot of water. And there's this one scientist that studied that system for about 10 years, uh, so got to understand mm -hmm. that one system really, really well. But then there's a lot of those in the Rockies that we haven't necessarily mapped out, and we don't necessarily know where they are. So there was that understanding of one system, uh, but it, it's going to be hard to kind of uh, extend that understanding to other environments. And in terms of groundwater and uh, glacier, it's one of the kind of the big unknowns, uh, groundwater and alpine systems. There's quite a lot of studies for groundwater in alpine catchments, so talus slopes, moraine ca that can hold water. And it's one, it been a big para paradigm shift in the last maybe 10 years that we thought that there was no groundwater action in, in the alpine system, but it turns out there's quite a lot. There's aquifer storage and things like that in the moraine. Um, but I haven't heard of anyone 
there's nothing that's published yet about uh, integrated glacier groundwater and surface water model. I have a colleague that's working on it. She's about to finish her PhD. Um, so hopefully there's going to be more. It's going to become more and more common. Uh, but I think that's really one of the kind of the gaps mm. in the in the research is that system. Maybe you should pick it up. The <laughs> I think Misaki Hayashi's group yeah. at U of C has done some yeah. work in the Lake O'Hara area yeah. related to glaciers and groundwater. There's actually been quite a bit done in Iceland related to the ice caps and the way they recharge the groundwater systems and the relationship to springs that emerge at the glacier surface. So that's another place to look. And then just as an interesting side note, um, there are people in glaciology who have used the, the model of a karst landscape to try and understand the way that water thermally erodes glaciers themselves and forms moulins and pools and cavities. And so that has been a conceptual model for the way that water and ice interact. Thank you. We have a question. Holly? Yeah. Hey. Thank you both for joining us today. An amazing structured conversation you gave. Um, Gwen, you made a comment about it being the responsibility of the um, experienced researcher or the one who runs the lab being responsible for the culture of the group. And I think that's something that's uh, very key and kind of mm -hmm. forthcoming right now um, across research community is just kind of also socially or globally. And I wondered if you could expand on that a little bit or reflect on how you learned that that responsibility lied with our leaders. Mm. I guess initially from collecting anecdotes from colleagues and friends mostly who had spent time in, in field environments mostly and other types of camps where they were not the leaders. And so their efforts to change culture were met with a lot of resistance or were futile in some cases. They were subcontractors or they were students. They were people um, who weren't in positions of power that were able to change those cultures. Another thing I did um, last year is I finally, after 14 years of my job, you know, I have all these expectations for students that are all up in my head and I found myself saying them over and over to each new student. I thought, I'm gonna write all these things down. So I wrote this 13 page document of student <laughs> expectations. Like the expectations just kept coming out. But part of that, um, I was thinking about setting the culture of the group. What goes on in the lab? What kind of, what do I expect of my students and of my research group in terms of how they engage in the science with each other, with the department, with the wider community? And I thought through all of those issues. And it just became clear to me that I was the one who could write this document and I was the one who could tell my st incoming students what the expectations were. I focus group this, um, this document with some of my former students and they helped me add to it. They said, you know, we, we do this, you should mention that in this document, or this is kind of the flavor of um, our work together. And so it just became clear to me that it's so much easier when you're the leader and you can establish something from the beginning. Um, and that it's really our responsibility. We shouldn't be relying on students coming to us with grievances to make these cultural changes. Thank you very much. With that, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to thank both of you again very much. We really appreciate it. It was a great end to what's been a really good series. So thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. I, before we end, I'd like to also thank Morgan and Mark and the webinar mm -hmm. AV team who have been with us through all of these lectures. We couldn't have done it without you. We wouldn't have people in the room or online yeah. without you. <laughs> so thank you ever mm -hmm. so much. There are people who aren't in the room, Michelle and others, who have helped with cookies and <laughs> with uh, accommodation and flights and things like that. So again, just want to recognize everyone. And thanks again to you for coming. This is a great turnout for the final lecture. We will be back next year and we will have some interesting formats and hopefully keep everyone on their toes so finally just a great big thank out to shout out to holly so thank you very much for <laughs> taking it on your shoulders <laughs> that's fine we should still have tea and coffee and thank you again to all of you online and take care <laughs>